The second panel is case studies, Coleptic and Utopian design projects and initiatives in Brazil, Mexico, and Venezuela. The two speakers are Seuler Lima, who's going to present the Bardi House, Buix, and Between. And the second speaker is Anelena Mallet, Michael Van Buren, Design for a Modern Mexico. I'm very honored to welcome Seuler Lima to present his. Um, his paper. When I was invited to give this talk, I thought about how to address it, and I had to make a choice. So instead of addressing design itself, I decided to focus a little bit more on the issue of domesticity <clears throat> and, uh, and the issue of modern, or what is modern to us, to Latin America, to Lina Bobardi. And uh, I'll leave the issue of design open to perhaps the the discussions we have afterwards. So bear with me. The house Lina Bobardi designed for herself in Sao Paulo is known for its large windows. The word for window in Portuguese, janela, comes from the Roman deity Janus, who represents transitions, the place where something ends and something else begins. Like the transitions that Janus symbolized, Bobardi's life and career straddled between different realities. Her design work developed between two countries and two projects of modernity. She was Italian and Brazilian, Roman and Milanese, from Sao Paulo and from Salvador. She aspired to the modern value system of her European origin. She also treasured her adopted country, especially because she found in it rich resources that were generally overlooked by modernist Brazilian architects and designers. She admired the ability of uneducated people to engage in creative activities and strived to combine different repertoires in her work. At the core of her legacy as an architect and as a designer is not a formal vocabulary, but an attitude. She searched for a cultural authenticity that was both visionary and grounded in history and in traditions. And so she produced hybrid expressions in her work merging like Janus, the beginning at the end of symbolic meanings. And I just added these pictures because this chair is in the exhibition and nobody knows actually that it is already a reprocessed idea of these uh, uh, African chairs that were published by a British magazine in the 1950s. So we're talking about authorship before and uh, I think that these issues might come back. <clears throat> I would like to explore these in-between features by focusing on the analysis of her first built architectural project, the house in which she lived during most of her life in Brazil. Its windows, its wide janelas, offer a passage into the depths of Bobardi's thinking. Through them, I would like to propose a few expl exploratory reflections contingent to this symposium about the conceptual and historical importance of the cultural differences that found room in her practice. Rather than being conclusive, I hope the considerations about one house in particular to be an invitation to examine not only that which modern architecture and design can be, but also our understanding of modernity at large. Lina Bobardi often favored, often favored in her design thinking and practice, the unstable negotiation between modern and non-modern values. She continually reserved, uh, reversed the relationship between the establishment and its margins. Her work and actions provide examples of a critical framework to reevaluate re the ties that modernity has established with culture in general, both educated and everyday culture, and with architecture and design in particular. She did not arrive at this attitude by coincidence. Her detachment from fixed concepts and her openness to changing forms of cultural staging largely contributed to her vision. It's not moving. Oh, here it is. Lina Bobardi's early career in Italy was convoluted. Since her education in Rome, she had been exposed to multiple and controversial definitions of architecture and design. When she entered the Facoltà di Architettura in 1934, the Italian architectural milieu was very active, but thrived with little consensus. Nevertheless, when she graduated in 1939, 
modern Italian architecture was already in crisis and Italy was about to enter the Second World War. At that moment, she decided without hesitation to follow her Milanese friend and classmate Carlo Pagani and to leave Rome for the more progressive north of the country. <laughs> she used to say she chose to be a designer when nothing was built, only destroyed. Away from what she described as the stale environment of the capital, Lina Bo received her second, edu second education in Milan, developing a career as a freelance editor and illustrator. She also contributed to the efforts of reconstruction, internalizing her generation's near realist sensitivity and trying to humanize design amidst the massive physical, social, and moral devastation of the end of fascism and the war. Despite material and emotional difficulties, her sojourn in Lombardy allowed her to spin the different artistic and intellectual threads that she would continuously weave throughout her life. Leaving Italy permanently was not in her plans when Lina Bo hastily decided in 1946 to marry Pietro Maria Bardi and join him on an adventure to sell his art collection in South America. On the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, Lina Bo, from then on Lina Bo Bardi, found a different environment and unmatched opportunities. Unexpectedly, was also rich in social and cultural analogies to the reality she had left in Italy, which allowed her, in an effort of translation, to continue pursuing her aspirations as a designer in her adopted country. In the second post-war period, Brazil invested massive, massively in industrial modernization. Art and architecture continue to have a central symbolic role in this process, not only in the establishment of a modern nation state as during Vargas' regime, but also as a means for educating the taste of a budding middle class. The creation of the Museum of Art of São Paulo, Maspi, which kept Bobardi and her husband from, from permanently returning to Italy, was a key player in those efforts. She had dedicated most of the first decade of her life in Brazil to her husband's museum project, engaging in the study and dissemination of modern culture in the country. She helped organize exhibitions about art and design that stressed the continuity between rationalism and handcraft practices. She also edited the groundbreaking magazine Habitat, which included articles about modern architecture, design, and arts, and arts, along with essays about simple and spontaneous creative practices. In Abita, she rehearsed the principles she would materialize in the work of maturity, especially after leaving her husband's shadow. And this happened in the 1960s. Her editorial interests in the early 1950s reveal more than her house alone her design aspirations and the aspects that have been overlooked in the historical and selective reception of her work, which was unable and perhaps unwilling to accept its contradictions. In order to examine the ambivalences in her architecture and mailing in her domestic architecture, I suggest looking at the example of her own house, which has been inaccurately called the glass house. I have selected this example not because it is paradigmatic or her most paradigmatic work, but because it is a transitional project and has been misunderstood. In addition, it concerns a great deal the theme and the period covered by the symposium. The historical acclaim and even the commercial interests surrounding this project have contributed to define it as a rationalist building, employing industrial materials and modernist aesthetic principles. However, at a closer look and comprehensive look, its hybrid features reveal that it's not radically different from other houses she designed around the same time, such as the Cito House in 1957, which stands three blocks away from this house, with a combination of allegorical, naturalistic vernacular and rural elements in mind. My goal in analyzing the so-called glass house, which I would rather call the Bardi House, is to reveal not that which we would like to see in it, but what it actually shows us. Conceived in 1949, the house completed in 1952 was planned according to the Bauhaus model of the Meisterhäuser, as well as of art schools in the United States. The idea was to create temporary residences for artists, teachers associated with Masby's Contemporary Art Institute. 
the pedagogical plan was abandoned, but the place became the body couple's uh, residence and eventually a long-lasting meeting point for many artists and intellectuals in Sao Paulo. Influenced by economic and geopolitical changes in the continent, Brazil was starting to shift its affiliation to European cultural values for another type of modernization, that of North America. With new influences came new defin definitions of urban space and domestic life. Morumbi was a new neighborhood, a new subdivision, that architect Osvaldo Bratzky had helped design on picturesque hills in Sao Paulo, according to an urban plan that merged the organic and naturalistic image of garden cities with the architectural model of case study houses from California. Lina Bobardi's house was the first building to be erected in this new subdivision. On the edge between a modern metropolis in expansion and the remains of an ancient agricultural society, the site used to be a tea plantation, she was finally able to articulate some of the, her design aspirations to merge simple materials, naturalistic references, and rationalist principles. The house's glazed volume, elevated from a dramatic promontory by daring slender steel pillars, soon became a model for the advertising campaign sponsored by the developers to sell about 200 lots to affluent homeowners. Both the campaign and the publications about the neighborhood insisted on this image of a rationalist and crystalline house that eclipsed the visibility of the whole project, the history of its design process, and its resulting ambivalent formal features. A visit to the building, however, reveals that the backside consists of a volume in white masonry walls dedicated to services, servants, and everyday housekeeping. Contrasting the front of the residence, this volume rests on the ground and is rooted in the ideas of simple construction techniques and rural architecture that Lina Bobardi so often cherished. To reassure those references, she added two traditional brick ovens in the backyard, as Habitat magazine reported in 1953. To her, this was the moment in which, as she described, popular architecture established an agreement with contemporary architecture. In the meantime, inside the house, a dishwasher, an electric garbage dispose disposal, an industrial stove, and foldable kitchen furniture suggested the industrial efficiency of suburban houses in the United States, and even the Frankfurt kitchen designed by Margarete schuter in 1926. Such home appliances were practically unheard uh, heard of in Brazil in the 1950s. Despite the high-tech appeal offered by the house as part of real estate publicity, however, those appliances were rarely used. The Bardis incorporated the Brazilian habit maintained to this date of having live-in domestic help. The house's ambiguous formal features also contained an ambiguous domestic life. On a closer look, Bobardi's design process for the house makes the juxtaposition of different aesthetic and social repertoires even clearer, although it sheds little light on how the developers' opinions and even Pietro Maria Bardi may have interfered in the process. Unlike the built project, the first study by Lina Bobardi, which you see here, produced for the house, shows her initial intention to work with natural materials. This practice was abolished in the course of the months that it took to finish the project, though similar elements would re-emerge with greater insistence in projects that she started to develop independently after the late 1950s. According to her first drawing for the house in Morumbi, Bobardi imagined a wooden frame sitting on concrete or stone foundation blocks. It's written here, legno fondato fondato su uh, conglomerato pietra. That's what it, she wrote. The image reminds us of the article she had published in Domos in 1944 on topics such as the comparison between traditional and modern houses on stilts and simple buildings created as an alternative to the shortage of industrial materials during the war. While writing articles for the Brazilian magazine Habitat, 
she seems to have continued to follow the Italian architectural debate closely as well. For example, the idea of her residence coincides with a program for the 1948 Milan Triennale, titled The House, the exhibition exposed to conf <laughs> proposed to confront rationalism with simple materials and techniques and traditional typologies attributing modern meaning to everyday buildings. That reference was more clearly in her imagination than the case study houses pursued by Osvaldo Bratki and the sub subdivision developers. The additional structures Bobardi designed on the hilly site around the house, and this is a model that's still there in the institute, which is the house itself. Um, well, the additional structures Bobardi designed on the hilly site around the house in the following decades attest to her sensitivity to technical simplicity and popular repertoires. Among them, one finds an unpretentious small house here to the right for domestic employees, a new garage covered with mosaic, which you don't see, it's on the other side of the driveway, and her 1986 office, which you see here to the left side, that resembles a simple cabin, una capana, as the Italians of her generation used to call it. Far from the public view, however, these buildings allowed her to experiment freely with traditional and natural materials. To this date, these small structures continue to orbit almost invisibly in the shadow of the original project, reducing the complexity of the whole estate and her architecture to the image of a rationalist glass house. At this point, I'd like to take a risk and to suggest that the formal features that remain concealed in Lina Bobardi's house also represent the instabilities that are inherent to modernity. As I said in the beginning, she often favored the uneven negotiation between modern and non-modern values, continually reversing the relationship between dominant culture and its margins. This brings us to the idea presented by sociologist Timothy Mitchell, who teaches here at Columbia University, that modernity is not a stage in history with a fixed time frame, but rather the representation, the staging of values and social practices. And so, as a cultural construct, modernity is particularly vulnerable to disruptions and open to the possibility of changes and to ambiguous fleeting meanings. This approach suggests that we cannot locate the origins and development of modernity entirely within a traditional Western framework. It reinforces the notion that modernity is a process of dialogic symbolic interactions and transformations and not the ascendance of that which is modern over its other, the non-modern, modern, or the West over its margins. Like Bobardi's house, modernity finds itself in the gap between different, though complementary, cultural repertoires. In that respect, one could say that she was more faithful throughout her career to the emancipatory concept of modernity than to the formal abstract language of modern architecture or design. Her thinking and practice emerged out of the encounter between different situations and worldviews, between north and south, between city and hinterland, and between privilege and deprivation. Bobardi remained faithful to the Enlightenment principles such as rational logic, scientific knowledge, and free will. Still, in different contradictions, she merged different and sometimes conflicting values and realities in her practice. And in so doing, she was not afraid of revealing aspects and conflicts that modernization tends to conceal. She believed that the work of architects and designers was not only an artistic endeavor, but also a collective duty, even if just in the design of a house or a piece of furniture. According to her, this commitment required, required the understanding of the physical world and people's living conditions, habits, and needs. In her opinion, architecture did not need to be modern necessarily. To her, it should above all be useful to those who inhabit it. 
Rather than a persuasive, persuasive modernist architect or designer, Lina Bobardi was a modern and skeptical designer and thinker. Instead of universal values, her complex and wide-ranging work reveals the role that plurality, difference, and instability play in the constitution of modernity. Rather than creating attractive forms, she strived to embrace the spontaneity of everyday life, and she spent her life in transit, traveling among the contingencies of different places. She developed her career in a movement in and out of modern culture, materialized in an unstable relationship between innovation and history, between abstraction and realism, and between rationalism and surrealism. And so she did by taking risks. Instead of certainty, she embraced doubt, negotiating between revolutionary impulses and melancholy. She used to say she was romantic, but never sentimental. Thank you. I want to really thank uh, Gabriela Rangel for the opportunity of working at the America Society and the opportunity of doing this show and to let me work with Jorge Rivas and Cecilia Lociavo. Uh, for me, it was indeed a great opportunity and I learned so much. I also want to apologize for my coughing. Oh, I'm, I have been really sick, but if I have an attack in the middle, you just have to be patient. So it's called uh, Van Buren Design for a Modern Mexico. National identity and collective utopia. The Mexican Revolution left behind an impoverished, divided nation in Israel. The year following its armed conflict brought on deep transformation, but as well a state-supported effort to lay out a project of common identity. Culture became a standard beneath which, which to achieve unity and cohesion. Jose Vasconcelo, Jose Vasconcelos, Mexico Minister of Education, promoted, among other projects, effort that saw painters take over the walls of public buildings to the big stories related to what was to be a new nation whose mixed race population would be empowered and where workers would enjoy unprecedented opportunities. Social themes became a hallmark of Mexican muralism, and painters such as Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and Jose Clemente Orozco, among others, fashion a sort of brotherhood, ultimately a collective movement that dream of changing visions of reality by means of public art. Mexican art in, in the 1930s included an interesting notion of collectivity. In addition to what was happening around mur muralism, other radical collectives emerged, such as the Liga de Escritores y Artistas Revolucionarios, the League of Revolutionary Writers and Artists, also known as LEAR, founded in 1933, which sought to denounce the inconsistencies and injustice of the Plutarco Elias Calles presidential administration, and did so by means of posters, periodicals, pamphlets, con concerts, stage events, and indeed, murals. Founded in 1937, Mexico Taller de Gráfico Popular was the first space given over to radical graphic arts that aspires to a social and political critique as well. Projects such as, the, such as this gave rise to a guild-like spirit and a use of the visual, cult, visual and cultural arts to change perception and the, at the grassroots level. These movements, understood as collective utopias, permeated Mexican history until well into the 1940s. Additionally, there were projects, projects with transformative and developmental aspiration that, while they emerged from a place of individuality, wielded such a collective impact that they determined how hundreds of Mexicans understood and inhabit reality. Such was the case with Michael Van Buren and his industrial design project, an individual utopia that developed into a collective reality. Michael Van Buren and the Mexican Adventure. Amid this panorama, toward the end of 1936, Michael Van Buren came to Mexico in search of new horizons and the chance to work as an unlicensed architect. Born in New York in 1911 to a well-to-do family with deep, roots, with deep roots in the city, he was always a rebel who had no use for rules or, or his family customs and tradition. In 1931, he went to Europe on a cargo steamer and upon arrival in Germany, enrolled at the legendary Bauhaus School in Dessau for the winter semester 1931-1932. He later signed up 
for Joseph Albert basic architecture course in the summer of 1932. When the Bauhaus relocated to Berlin, Van Buren followed and took his last class there in the winter 1933, the year the school officially closed. After his stint at the Bauhaus, he was one of a group of graduates who took private classes from Ludwig, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe for a few months between 1934 and 1935. Back in New York in, 19, in 1937, as he sought to finish his NYU architect degree, Van Buren met a businessman with interest in Mexico who asked him to design and build bungalows at the Flamingos Hotel in Acapulco. After his stay and the then idyllic resort, Van Buren went to Mexico City where he hoped to practice architecture. He managed to build a couple of houses, but was held back by his lack of a formal degree. However, he did find a niche in the market that had, until then, been barely exploited, modern furnishing. Joining forces with German designers Klaus Grabe, a former classmate for the Bauhaus, and American architect Morley Worth, he started a small design workshop they called Grabe and Van Buren. They set demanding standards for the workshop for the workshop where they design and build a unique line of furniture whose extreme technical perfection and original modernist aesthetic reflected their own training. What set the workshop apart from other was that these designers' introductions of modern furnishing engineer for mass production in Mexico. Van Buren and Grave reached Mexico at a vibrant, volatile time aiming a flurry of cultural and intellectual activity, largely focused on self-reflection and consideration of national identity and Mexican society's defining traits. As foreign, both men were in a position to view their surrounding objectively, unencumbered by local biases. They incorporated vernacular materials they incorporated vernacular materials into their design, like jute and other natural fibers with symbolic links to rural and indigenous traditions that native-born Mexican designers, they're not to use for fear that, in the local context, they connoted a cheap or inferior design. Grave and Van Buren understood the Mexican middle-class furniture market and decided to take advantage of local conditions, including labor, materials, and local, and local forms. Though they did not start out with any notion of creating nationalistic designs, their aesthetic ideas ultimately formed part of a search of national identity that dominated Mexican artistic and cultural disclosure of the day. In 1940, New York Museum of Modern Art organized the industrial design competition for the 21 American Republic, a competition that, for the first time, invited particip participation from Latin American designers. Grave, and Van Grave, Van Buren, and Webb took one of the four prizes awarded to Latin America with an original, original chaise long in Primavera Wood, Metal, and Woven Rope that Domus, their principal product line as well as the name, of the workshop and shop had produced. Uh, this is the Alacran that it's also on the show. Uh, the Grave and Van Buren factory uh, was renamed Domus after Grave left Mexico. A few years later, Michael's brother, Frederick Van Buren, also an engineer, and, an engineer took charge of production and the firm's name changed again to Van Buren SADCB, even as furnishing were still known as Domus. Michael Van Buren, continued to operate in the char characteristically intelligent fashion, his finger on the market pulse ever sensitive to its potential. Uh, one notable example of this approach is seen in, the 1947, is seen in 1947 in the design of the Miguelitos and San Miguelitos armchair, armchair product lines that, as you can see, resemble very much the butaque we've been talking about. The chairs were modern version of the traditional Mexican city known as butaques that virtually every designer in the 20th century Mexico ultimately came for. Van Buren applied principles he learned at the Bauhaus and ignored contemporary nationalist debates. A pragmatist, he relied on his, on his, own, behalf, on his own beliefs ideals and experience to work with local materials and craftsmen, yet endow his furnishing with a more universal style that helped to distinguish and quite possibly define the taste and interest of a new urban middle class in Mexico. 
The Pino 5000 and the Nessa lines, Michael Van Buren designed in 1957, 19, between 1957 and 1960, in collaboration with British architect Philip Gilmind, represented a pinnacle of creativity and experimentation. Working in pine and mahogany, the designer created collections of popular modular pieces that assembled easily. Each furnishing features sections produced on the same machinery that were designed for easy storage. The strategy was the key to mass production that allowed Van Buren to sell designer furniture at very com competitive prices. In its day, Van Buren factory produced some 50 chairs, wi 50 chairs weekly, grew rapidly and positioned its line as the finest furnishing on the market due to their quality, good design, and accessible cost. One indication of such is that the legendary Mexican ar architect Mario Pani designed the Centro Urbano Nonualco Tlatelolco, a groundbreaking modern housing development for state workers. Uh, sorry, one indication of such is that when legendary Mexican architect Mario Pani designed the Centro Urbano Nonualco Tlatelolco, a groundbreaking modern housing development for state workers, the development promotional literature portrait model units outfitted in furnishing from Van Buren, Danessa Line. And this is uh, one of the advertisements. By 1955, the factory had become a sort of company town, quite possibly inspired by the progressive era company towns that had proliferated in the United States since the late 19th century. The Van Buren brothers started building houses for their employee, employees on lots surrounding the factory and bought a sawmill on the outskirts of Mexico City in order to control every facet of their operation. In a vertical integration model similar to those adopted by large, large industrial corporation. Their paternalistic entrepreneurial vision informed the relationship between the company and its workers. They believed that if their own efforts provided them with a better lifestyle, the same privilege should be extended to employees who did the hands-on work. As such, many employees own company-sponsored residences, either near the factory or elsewhere in the city. Most managed to furnish their homes in Van Buren, thanks to the company reasonable, reasonable prices. By then, the, work, the workforce had grown so much that the Van Buren's allowed the formation of a union, which we, they always remain on good terms, even accompanying employees on company, even accompanying employees and company trips to various Mexican destinations. Company anniversary and Christmas parties became a huge tradition celebration attended by all employees and their family. Music and dancing, mariachis of course, were part of the fun and some employees say that even the famed Mambo King Perez Prado performed at one celebration. The Van Buren also encouraged employee social and sporting events, and there were baseball and soccer teams that played with the company logos on their jersey. The socializing and the strong corporate philosophy united Van Buren employees as a sort of extended community that bonded with a dependent on the company at large. Van Buren SADCB stayed in the business until 1971, when it was sold to Singer, the American sewing machine company that for many years had commissioned the Van Buren factory to produce cabinets for its machine. Well into the 1980s, Singer continued producing certain Van Buren li lines until they sold the factory to other owners. The factory retained its name until, a f until just a few months ago. The current owners use the Van Buren name to market low-quality, historic, historicist design furniture with practi practically no connection to the factory's heyday. Like other designers in Mexico and Latin America, Michael Van Buren based his work on formal and technical expression of rationalist European modernism and the so-called international style. But those repertoires were more a means than an end. Once he began to develop his products, he took what he l had learned from Europe and adapted it to his own agenda, and most of all, to create a national design identity compatible with the with the society and cultural environments he envisioned for a modern Mexico. A revolutionary aspiration to social change and aesthetic renovation associated with a European avant-garde, particularly the Bauhaus, was the essential pillar of his design experiment. The factory Van, the factory Van Buren founded can be considered a sort of social 
and business experiment in which design and model furnishing, furnishing so to aesthetically and culturally instruct white swaths of Mexican society, improve its everyday existence, modify its way of habitation, and above, and above all, help eliminate social barriers that have characterized it throughout its history. Michael Van Buren wisely leveraged the emergence of new markets as a Mexican middle class ascended and solidified. The factory furnishings were directed to this niche. Production was carried out as a volume that afforded accessible prices, and as a result, most Van Buren employees at some point managed to acquire the company's product. Van Buren also understood the importance of production flex flexibility and adapting production to different tastes and requirements. It led to furniture families from the Danesa and Pino 500 line that could be mass produced and that availed themselves for, of interchangeable, interchangeable pieces whose finishes, stains, and upholstery adapted to end client taste. While at first Van Buren furniture were inspired by European repertoires, then in fashion, they were also distinguished by the way they adapted such designs to Mexican realities. Local wood, seed and seed bags in palm and other natural fibers, as well as organic form associated with local vegetations or cultures, even re reinterpretation of popular and autochthonous furnishing, all formed part of the Van Buren strategy. Muebles Van Buren S.A. de C.B. began as an individual utopia, but ultimately it became a collective reality involving participation on the part of factory workers, as well as a new Mexi Mexican middle class, the natural con consumers of furnishing types that can now be recognized as watershed in Mexican industrial and modern design. Thank you very much. So, both Lina Bobardi and, and Van Buren were not born in Latin America and they were part of that diaspora or, you know, re-localization um, of people after the war. Uh, in the case of Van Buren, it was more like a personal quest. In the case of Lina, Van Bu uh, Lina Bobardi, yes, <laughs> in the case of Lina Bobardi, it was more, you know, um, looking for a new reality because Europe was, you know, practically destroyed, and her husband was being accused of being, you know, a fascist. In a way, that's what I read. I don't know; it's part of a mythology. But they went to, they decided to go to Brazil and start, you know, a new business. But I'm interested in the in the in the um, in the reception of the works of both. What is because Lina Bobardi was very much after her trip to Bahia. She became very much involved in the, into the fabric, the intellectual fabric of Brazil. <coughs> and she began a series of collaborations with key people, <coughs> intellectuals, uh, Darcy Ribeiro, Eros Gonzalez, uh, people that I probably forgot the names, but they were very much into the, into the um, interdisciplinary um, you know, kind of collaboration, and also with, uh, with Glauber Rocha the filmmaker. Um, I don't see that happening in Van Buren. I see Van Buren very much, you know, like um, enclosed in, in, his, in his little, you know, realm that he created. I mean, he, he was more, uh, more an entrepreneur than an intellectual. And he was very much into making money and really trying to survive in a new country. But uh, that doesn't mean he didn't like really got close to all these uh, artistic and intellectual uh, uh, circles. He was uh, he was close to Clara Porcet, and mm -hmm. uh, something like really interesting is that Van Buren's brother Frederick Van Buren married to this amazing woman who did Martinez Van Buren, who opened like the first high-end Mexican restaurant uh, called La Fonda del Refugio, and it was decorated <coughs> not by Van Buren but by Mario Pani which the, uh, by Arturo Pani that he did mostly European styles. But this was a Mexican restaurant. I haven't found any photos of the original decoration. But in that place, many of the intellectuals gather every Thursday. And for example, Chabela Vargas, that you probably know, uh, this uh, uh, folk singer uh, adopted by Almodovar in many of his films, uh, debutate, uh, she presented for the first time at the Fonda del Refugio. 
So kind of the Van Buren where uh, they host all these kind of people and it, uh, he was more an entrepreneur and really uh, a, a, people, a, a, a guy that thought of like having the work done. But its surroundings, no, he was married to a dancer, so so he was close to this uh, to these people. He didn't write a lot, and many of his ideas, so I, I got them from like speaking to the people of the factory and the sons and the people around him. But he didn't write a lot, so that's uh, something that it's kind of missing compared to Lina Bobardi, no. It's very interesting. This encounter makes me think that in Van Bruggen we have a great entrepreneur, so we should admire the enterprise. And I think in Lina Bobardi's case, we should admire the odyssey. Um, she, and if you look at uh, her attempt, along with uh, Pietro Mayabardi and also Carlo Pagan, uh, Palanti, who was another immigre, who was about 10 years older than she was, who had come from Milan, they started in 1948, which is more or less the same time, a firm that lasted about two years where they actually did very similar work, trying to uh, combine and merge these popular uh, influences and natural materials as well as uh, techniques with uh, a great influence of uh, Milanese design at that time. However, Pietro Maria Bardi's ability as an entrepreneur was a very um, feeble, and uh, we should always admire his ability uh, to create these incredible odysseys. So if you look at that uh, uh, enterprise, it was closed in two years. And the justification that they gave is that they were not able to establish a good relationship with, um, with producers or the industry. And actually, they were good producers in Brazil. So it's kind of a, a mystery uh, why they failed. But if you look at even the art institute that they put together, it was also another incredible odyssey that turned out not to be such a good enterprise. So, uh, and Habitat is a magazine as well. So uh, I think it's, I have a friend who is a historian who writes a lot about colonization by the Portuguese, and she's, you know, the difference between Brazil and the United States is how you should admire the Odyssey and have many doubts about the enterprise, and the other way around about the United States. <laughs> you know, should have doubts about the Odyssey and admire the enterprise. But the second part of the point <laughs> is um, <laughs> that uh, there's also something very interesting that is happening in this time frame, and coincidentally we didn't, we didn't um, think about it together, but we're talking about the early early 50s, late 1940s, and this desire both in Mexico and in Brazil to um, somehow foster this idea of a budding middle class and uh, what happened in Brazil that this middle class was educated not only in the arts but also in the universities. And in 1960s, it's exactly this middle class that had been educated that turned out to show its other face, which they became very involved with leftist politics, especially after 1959 with the Cuban Hat Revolution. So there's this enormous effort where these people who are coming out of universities, who are becoming professionals, to abandon what they imagine to be this bourgeois version of middle class <coughs> and to engage in a very broad project of uh, a socialization of culture. And she is going to find all these um, as she, she leaves, Lina Bobardi leaves the shadow of her husband and uh, the influences of Sao Paulo, the industrialization, and she goes to the north of the country. She's going to find companions in her odyssey that really are going to uh, allow her to finally flourish the way that he, she expected she had been uh, um, uh, you know, trying to build up in the last 15 years, since uh, even probably 20 years since leaving school. And uh, finally, in Salvador with Glauber Rocha, who was a filmmaker who was very young at the time, Darcy Ribeiro, who was a famous anthropologist. But all the, the cultural movements, uh, they were involved with popular culture. They were influenced by French movements at the time. So it's very interesting that this middle class had um, also its own history in, in Brazil. And perhaps that's the middle class that Van Buren never really abandoned. I don't know. I don't know about uh, exactly uh, if there are other figures in Mexico that might have engaged uh, after the Cuban Revolution and with all the, uh, Mexico has a different history than some countries in South America. Yes. But uh, you know, these are my two points about uh, what Gabriela is saying. Well, you, you talk also about the negotiation mm -hmm. between the modern and the non-modern aspects of, you know, reality in, in, in particular in Brazil, but in mm -hmm. Mexico is the same thing. And I was wondering, 
What is that negotiation in the case of Van Buren? I mean, I'm th I think he keeps on negotiating what I was talking about, like a way of representing national, uh, but also keep being modern, no? Uh, the Bauhaus style, but mm -hmm. all those small details that had to do with Mexican craftsmen and uh, attaching himself to the tradition, but also trying to be modern and be industrial in a way. I think that was kind of the shift between what he was doing and what Clara Porcet was doing, that it was not, Clara Porcet was, was not industrial until like the 60s, the 60s that he, she started working <coughs> with this company by royalties. But Van Buren always was there uh, fighting for industrialization and not really, like the craftsmanship was part of it, but he really was an industrial, so he really was thinking forward on that. So that industrial structure was really um, <coughs> allowed him to to produce lower cost furniture that was distributed nationally, nationally, and even I mean he even well he don't actually he didn't actually really export it, but many uh, like, like families yeah mm -hmm. yes he was kind of like many families that bought Van Buren at their time in the 40s and 50s even traveled with their. Uh, with their Van Buren furniture here to the States. And he really managed, for example, the Pino 5000 was like really, really, really cheap and really resistant. So it was really not only middle class, but like uh, middle to low classes that really got hold of, uh, of Van Buren furniture. And they were sold at this really popular level, not only on at, uh, on at his shop, but he distributed in all of the big uh, up the up department stores and even like these huge uh, fairs of the home or like I I national na national wide fairs, and and they were like really sh cheap and really accessible in a way. And for Lina, was a reconciliation of industrial design with craft, industrial design. More than reconciliation, I think that that came from uh, her exposure. <coughs> Many people say that she worked with Dior Ponce. She actually was exposed to him. She did some work mm -hmm. when she was in Milan, and uh, she. Uh, like many other designers in Italy, were very interested in this idea that uh, the traditions of craft in Italy would move progressively into industrialization. So she brought that idea to Brazil and she expected to find that. Mm -hmm. However, um, as she tried, including when she was in Salvador, to create an alternative school of design, uh, which she called the Popular University and had other names, and this was uh, her alternative to the UM school, um, she came to the understanding that Brazil did not have, she came to the understanding that Brazil did not have the same tradition of guilds that existed in since, you know, the late Middle Ages in Florence that allowed for um, 20th century designers to really build on the skills and the ability or even in the craftsmanship the craftsmanship that um, uh, existed in Italy. And so her desire to uh, create this school of design in which she would put in contact these people who created spontaneously objects that she you know, profoundly admired, uh, that was never completed because her work was interrupted, perhaps to her fortune, by the military dictatorship, showed um, an impasse. And, um, which is exactly her perception that without that tradition of craft that existed in Italy, she would never be able to uh, create a Brazilian design in the way that she imagined. And that's in 1980, she wrote a very melancholy book that was only published posthumously called Design at an Impasse, in which she talks about this difficulty and her, her disillusionment. And then she started to call this, that Brazil did not have a tradition of craft, that she called the pre-craftsmanship. So in a way, uh, comparing it to <coughs> medieval practice and not necessarily to a Renaissance uh, practice that you know, evolved in, into, Italy, in, into the 20th century in Italy. But um, still, for a long time, and when she, she taught design at the University of Sao Paulo, and she still in Salvador decided to, to do in all many of the exhibitions de dedicated to design, was this idea of documenting, bringing together this knowledge about craft in Brazil and trying to induce that to be uh, the, the basis or the springboard for a process of industrialization that would be authentic to the country. And then she said it's not nationalist 
because that brought uh, her back to these very difficult memories of fascism, but they should be <coughs> national popular, in which was also a reference to Antonio Gramsci, who was a very, very important philosopher who she read in the 1960s. So I don't know if this <laughs> answers her question, but there, it's, but it's she, a very but complex she, but process. But she mapped the, those problems through, mm -hmm. you know, these um, exhibitions that he, she organized with the Bahia Nordeste. Uh, she did. With her associate people, mm -hmm. which were not precisely people coming from our history mm -hmm. or criticism. They came from theater and they came mm -hmm. from sociology and they came from choreography and they came from ethnology. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's really interesting how mm -hmm. she, you know, managed to map, you know, that tradition that need she needs in mm -hmm. order to decide. Yeah. <laughs> so the School of Design yeah. was based on several institutions, and one of them was this popular mu Museum of Popular <coughs> Art. That is probably the only piece that remains from the 1960s of her work in Salvador. So it was this triad between a school, a center for documentation, and uh, a center of practice uh, of craft in which uh, the students would have contact with the. Uh, these, uh, you know, lay people would come and, and teach. But the other thing about the exhibitions is that they evolved in time. So they started with a collection, and she revised these exhibitions between the 1960s and the 1980s. Uh, the last ones were at Cesc Pompeia. But then the way that she describes them real, uh, reveals this impasse and reveals her discomfort, also with her own ideas and her own aspirations and feeling like, always trying to defend him, herself that there's, uh, and realizing that the country had left uh, behind an opportunity to pursuing this more authentic, according to her uh, uh, thread, and actually had, as she said, chosen finesse, which is uh, her critique of how design had turned to be in, um, in Brazil in the 1980s, especially at the end of the dictatorship, and with uh, you know the the massive uh, production and consumption uh, of these uh, industrialized goods, so um, even th there's a history, there's a genealogy in the exhibitions that are an effort of documenting, but also are a process of recognition of the impossibility and the and the impasses and the predicament of that project, which I think, <coughs> I mean, from a scholar point of view, it's fascinating because I love paradoxes, but from <laughs> from a, a realistic point of view, it's really an enormous challenge. Yeah. Do you want to say something? Let's let's open to the to the public. Uh, yes. I, I have a, a question for uh, Your title uh, is a uh, design uh, or the house as uh, the twist and the twin between. Uh, is that referring? as a kind of a contradiction or a hybrid uh, construction? Um, probably neither of them. I think I tried to show that it's in the gap. Um, it's in the crack <laughs> between uh, these worlds. So it's both and n neither of them at the same time. It's, uh, so it's, it's actually trying to, to show that it's a dialogic uh, relationship that she's trying to, as probably Gabriela was saying, to reconcile. Realities, realities that were very difficult to reconcile. Right. So, so I, I seeing, seeing that as a staging, as uh, Timothy Mitchell describes it, it's not necessarily yeah, as an object or. Uh, in your analysis of the house, you mentioned that the house is Is for me a, a, a serious 
misunderstand? Well, I'm sorry if I gave you the impression that I am proposing a dualism. That's not what I plan. I mean, that has to do probably with the length of my, of my analysis. What I'm trying to say is that they're more like yin and yang, that both, they contain both elements. And so both reveal the desire of negotiating with these, uh, with these different realities, <coughs> with these different references. The point is, uh, is that um, for her, her generation, there was, you know, if you look historically in the 1935, 36, uh, before, uh, it was 1935, there was this large exhibition of rural architecture, but Enrico Persico, who organized it, unfortunately died, so there's no continuity. And so only 10 years later, there was some kind of a reconsideration of uh, that as a way of um, uh, reconciling with um, what traditions to subscribe to in Italy, considering that all the classical traditions had been um, embraced by fascism. So um, the option was to look at these rural traditions and infuse rural, rural architecture with modernist values. <coughs> and I think that that's what I was trying to say, that the house is not rural, but it's an image that's a staging of an idea of rural architecture that tries to represent what these architects saw as modern in those houses. So I apologize if I didn't go into depth <coughs> in that, but in any case, I'm not trying to present the house as a, as a dual house or having two faces, even though my references to Janice, they, they belong to the same thing. Uh, we have, we have uh, space only for one more question to Annelina, maybe? <laughs> yes? I was wondering, in both cases, were there a lot of negative reactions to both artists from locals or either other artists in both countries that said, what are foreign people doing here creating our national identity? Were there a lot of attacks or frustrations involved? I don't think so. By the time like Van Buren started working and, and he was not really working like his work was not a, dis a discussion in the art world. He was like more bringing like good furniture to the new middle class, and and it was like really welcome, you know, because uh, before the revolution, the fashion in Mexico was to use and to aspire for these historicist styles to have like Chippendale dining rooms and Louis Louis XV uh, living rooms. So uh, it was. I mean, it was really well received, and it was like right at the moment that like really Mexican people needed that. They didn't want like the typical Mexican furniture, neither the historic the Chippendale style or whatever that was that by the time. They really wanted something modern, something that they were looking at the magazines, you know, in Europe and in the States, saying this is this is the modern world, and through Van Buren you're able to to get it, no? So I, I think it was like really well received. It was not, I mean, it was not polemic at all, I think. Well, thank you very much. If you want to go to more questions. <laughs>